Hi students, welcome to the notes about matter and atoms. Get out your science notebook and let's get started. Remember, because this is a video, you can always pause if you need some time to write things down. Let's start with writing the essential question. I recommend writing this at the top of your page, maybe even in a colored pen or highlighting it. It's super important because it's the focus question. Basically, if you can answer this question with some detail and examples by the end of these notes, then you're going to do really well, and they're directly related to the learning objectives of the course. Our essential question for these notes is, what is matter, and how do we draw Bohr models? Let's start with chemistry. This is the course you're taking right now. Chemistry is the study of matter and changes of matter. Now, you might be asking, why do we have to take chemistry? Well, chemistry is known as the central science, and all other science really depends on chemistry because all other sciences depend on understanding matter. If you want to be a biologist or a biochemist, if you want to learn about the natural world through physics or environmental science, if you're interested in stars or astronomy or the earth and geology, ge geology or you want to take go into medicine and be a doctor or, or a nutritionist, all of these things really revolve around chemistry and the study of matter. So what is matter? Matter is anything that has mass and occupies space. Take a look at these pictures here. Things to the left of the dotted line are matter. Things like batteries and viruses, DNA, atoms, clouds or wind, and even balloons filled with different types of gases. And the, maybe even the fire pit that you sat next to holds matter because the logs have mass and they occupy space. Now, things to the right of the dotted line are not matter. They don't have mass. They don't occupy space. Sound is an example of that. Your emotions, your thoughts, and your feelings. And things like electricity and heat, those don't have mass or occupy space. They're more of just forms of energy. Matter revolves around atoms because atoms are the building blocks of matter. I like to think of atoms kind of like Legos. They build up all things that are made of matter. They are the smallest piece of matter with distinct properties. So for example, take a few atoms, put them together, and you get elements. Take a few elements and you put them together and you get molecules. This is what we're going to be talking about in chemistry course. From this point, you can really build anything. For example, molecules, put a few together and you'll get DNA, which is the blueprint of you. DNA, tightly bound together, make up chromosomes. And chromosomes are found inside the nuclei of cell. Cells make up your organs. They make up who you are. And they build you. So atoms are the building blocks of matter. Now, atoms aren't the smallest piece of matter. They're just the smallest piece with distinct properties. We can find differences between different types of atoms. But we know now that atoms are made of even smaller things, protons, neutrons, and electrons, for example. But there's no difference between one proton and another. And in fact, protons and neutrons are even made of even smaller things called quarks, more recently discovered. How big is an atom? Well, I want to give you an analogy. Take your finger, swipe it on the table, and see if you can pick up a speck of dust. It might be really hard to see. Specks of dust are really small, but not as small as atoms. So we're going to use a speck of dust as an analogy. The speck of dust, by size, is halfway between the size of the Earth and an atom. A atoms are super small. In fact, a speck of dust is made of thousands, millions of atoms. Now, how do we know so much about atoms? Well, this knowledge has been built up over time. Starting at 460 BC, the first person that started thinking about atoms, Democritus. And we've built over time our understanding and knowledge of atoms, even to more recent times. So this is the model of an atom that you're going to need to know. You're going to want to draw this picture and know these parts. Let's start with the center of the atom called the nucleus. Inside the nucleus, are two particles, protons and neutrons. Protons are super important. They provide positive charge to the atom, but they also give the atom its special identity. Remember, atoms can be different than one another because of their protons. Also in the nucleus are neutrons. Neutrons have zero charge. We say that they're neutral, which is where the word neutrons come from. Neutrons do have a task though. They provide the nuclear glue. They hold the atom's nucleus together. They keep those protons together. 
Now the nucleus itself, because of the protons, is positively charged. The nucleus is also where all of the mass of an atom is stored. Even though the nucleus is the smallest part of an atom, it doesn't really take up much space. It has a very small volume. Surrounding the nucleus is the thing called an electron cloud. And in that cloud are electron particles. Electrons are negatively charged. So the electron cloud is negative because electrons are attracted to the positive nucleus. That cloud does not have any mass, but it provides the atom a large volume comparatively. This model of an atom that we're looking at is called a Bohr model of an atom. And it's super important because it tells us a little bit about energy levels of electrons. Electrons in the lowest energy level are closest to the nucleus, and in the highest energy level are farther away from the nucleus. Electrons typically stay in their energy levels, but can jump if, you, if they receive and lose energy in the form of heat or light. In fact, many of you are gonna do a lab called the flame test, and you're gonna see that kind of happening. The flame test gives gives evidence for the Bohr model of an atom and electron energy level jumps. The different flames shown by different elements and atoms are because electrons are jumping up and down between energy levels. Now, let's talk a little bit about the periodic table of elements. This periodic table you'll see all over the place in chemistry, and it organizes atoms by their chemical and physical properties. So we can use the periodic table to find information about atoms and to be able to draw Bohr models. Now, a copy of a periodic table is found in your course resources. You might want to go find the, picture, the copy of your periodic table that you need for this course, because it has lots of important information. Let's take a look at an example of one of the elements on the periodic table and extract the information from it. Here's carbon. Now, the information you see up here, these labels are really important. One of the numbers you're going to see on each element is the atomic number. That's the identity of the atom. You're also going to see the element symbol, which is how we usually write it in things simply in books, and an element name, such as carbon. You're also going to see the atomic mass, which represents the mass of the nucleus. Now, from this information, we can really understand the different parts of the subatomic particles of an atom. Now, the subatomic particles are the protons, neutrons, and electrons. So how many protons does an element have from the periodic table? Well, the number of protons is equal to the atomic number. Remember, the atomic number is an atom's identity, so the number of protons is always the atomic number. The number of neutrons is a little bit more challenging to figure out, and you're going to need to understand how an atom works to do it. Well, if you remember, neutrons are part of the nucleus or the mass of an atom. So if we know the mass of an atom and subtract the number of protons, then we can figure out how many neutrons there are. And so that's basically for the average of that element's isotope. We'll talk about isotopes at a later date. Don't worry so much about that word. Just write it down for now. The number of electrons is a little bit simple because if we know that electrons are negatively charged and they're attracted to protons, which are positively charged, for a neutral atom or an atom that doesn't have a charge, there should be the same amounts of protons and electrons. So carbon here, let's take a look at carbon and give an example. So for a carbon atom, looking at the information, there are six protons. That's the atomic number. That's the identity of an atom. Only carbons have six protons. How about numbers of neutrons? Well, if we know the mass is 12 and the mass has neutrons and protons, if we subtract the six protons from the mass, we'll be left with the number of neutrons. So there are six neutrons in a carbon atom, in, a, in an average carbon atom. Finally, the number of electrons. Well, if we assume that this carbon atom has no charge, which is what we're going to do at the beginning of this course, then the electrons are the same as the number of protons. There's six positive protons, so there has to be six negative electrons. All right, now that we have that bit of information, we can start drawing our own Bohr model. We have a periodic table and we know how it works. We can start building Bohr models for any atom from that. So Bohr models, this is the method that we're gonna use to figure out how to draw them. If you have a periodic table, I'd like to do this thing called the board game method. The board game method basically uses the periodic table kind of like a board game in order to draw an element. Now, two things you need to know. 
First, the energy levels or the rings around a Bohr model are designated by the row number that element resides in. Now, the electrons placed in each ring are designated by the element's spaces in a row. That might be confusing for now, but bear with me and go through an example with me and hopefully you'll understand a little bit better. But that's where the board game comes into place. Now, there are a few special rules. The green elements on this periodic table are called transition metals, and their electrons don't live at the top level, they actually drop down one. And then the bottom of the periodic table, these lanthanides and actinides drop down two energy levels. And I'll give you an example of that as well. But let's go ahead and get started. We're going to start with our example of carbon. So we already know what the nucleus looks like based on the information from the periodic table. There are six protons and six neutrons because the nucleus weighs 12. So I'm gonna go ahead and just draw that nucleus in there and label the protons and neutrons. All right, carbon is found right here on the periodic table. Notice this in the second row of the periodic table. I realize there's a big gap in that row, but that's okay. We're gonna consider it part of the second row of the periodic table. That means that this carbon atom has two energy levels and electrons go on those energy levels. So what we're going to do is we're going to figure out how many electrons go on each energy level. So we're going to use the elements on the periodic table and their placement to kind of figure that out. This is where the board game comes into place. So I have my board game piece right here, and I'm going to follow along on the periodic table to put electrons in their proper energy level. We always start at the beginning of our board game. Now on the first energy level, there are one two spaces. That means in my Bohr model, at the lowest energy level, or the one closest to the nucleus, I'm going to put two electrons. All right, there are no more spaces on row number one, or energy level number one, so I'm going to jump to the next available energy level. In the second energy level, there's one, two, three, and four. I'm going to stop on carbon because that's the element I'm going to try to get to. So that means that there are four electrons on the second energy level of carbon. And we did it. We just drew a Bohr model of carbon. And all the other elements really generally rely on that. All right, so let's review this again. The energy levels equals the row number of that element. The electron placement are just based on element spaces in a row. So we're just using the periodic table kind of like a board game to figure out where the electrons go on each energy level. And we just build up to that element. Now there are two more special rules which we're gonna see right now. And that's the these elements in the transition metals, right? So we have these guys that are green right here and these guys down here that kind of have special rules. I'm not going to worry so much about the lanthanides and actinides, but these green guys drop down an energy, energy level. Remember that when we do our next example. In fact, I want to see if you can figure this example out by yourself. Using that bits of information, see if you can figure out what arsenic's Bohr model looks like. Pause the video right now and see if you can try it on your own piece of paper. Did you pause the video? Did you try it yourself? I sure hope so. The best way to learn is to try yourself and make those mistakes. I'll help you right now and show you how it works, but at least you'll have thought about it for a little bit. All right, I'm going to find arsenic on the periodic table. Here it is in the fourth row. Now, I'm going to build the nucleus of arsenic first. So I look at arsenic and I see that arsenic has a, a protons that are 33 because the atomic number is 33. Now, the number of neutrons is 42 because the atomic mass is 75. If I take that mass and take away the protons, that leaves me with 42 neutrons. So my nucleus has a mass of 75 total. All right, arsenic is in the fourth energy level, which means it has four rings. The lowest energy level is the closest to the nucleus and the farthest is the highest. So I know that electrons are going to fill up to four rings for arsenic. So this is where I'm going to pour my game piece out. All right, starting at the first row or the first energy level, I see that there are two spaces my little pond can go through. And so I have two electrons that go on that first energy level. That energy level is done. Now I'm going to jump to the next energy level and I'm going to go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So now we've gone past carbon and we're filling up that second energy level all the way full with eight electrons. All right, let's go to the next energy level. The next energy level is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight as well. So the third energy level has built with eight electrons too. All right, 
let's go to the next energy level. One, two. All right, so there's two electrons that go on that high energy level. We've now reached these weird elements that kind of sit lower on the periodic table. If you looked at our rules before, these electrons actually fall back in energy level. So instead of going on the fourth energy level, they actually go on the third energy level. So starting with SC, I'm going to go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. Notice all of these electrons from these spaces go on the third energy level instead of the fourth. All right, now we're going to go back up to the normal main group elements, and those electrons go back to the fourth level. One, two, three. We're stopping on arsenic, and we've created our Bohr model. So this is the Bohr model for arsenic. Kind of a lot of work, but it lets us know the energy levels of electrons, as well as what the nucleus is made of, of positive and neutral charge. All right, that leads us to the end of our notes. Now is a good time to take a moment to go back through your notes and review the information. You might want to highlight key terms using a highlighter or colored pencil. This is a great time to ponder and ask questions. Do you, can you answer those questions? Can you seek answers to those questions? Can you ask questions for your instructor or seek answers in other places? Also, you remember that essential question? Take some time right now and see if you can write a summary to answer that essential question. What claim do you have to that essential question? Can you provide evidence and examples? And can you reason with that evidence to show that your evidence supports your claim? All right, that's the end of the notes. Good luck, everybody.